Uh, well, we have good news. We have Howard Katzenberg, the finance chief of OnDAC here. We have Catherine Petralia, the chief operating officer of Cabbage, and Samir Galati, the chief operating officer of Lending Club. Now, for those of you that were at the CB Insights conference last year, we had a panel on the state of alternative lending, and the questions there were a lot more existential. Um, it was a few weeks after Lending Club uh, went through what it calls its May 9th event, um, and a year later, Samir can kind of tell us how that's gone. But uh, to start, I just want to ask uh, each, each panelist, um, you know, we've seen the market for some alternative lending products uh, change pretty drastically over the past year. Um, you know, some of your companies have been around for a long time. You know, you put out a size of the possible addressable market when you first started. That might have changed over the years. But why don't, to start for the audience, tell us what you think the size of the addressable market for small business lending, in your case, for consumer lending, Samir, in your case, is today, and how that's changed over the past year. Howard, why don't you start with I'll you? Start. Good afternoon, everyone. So I think there's, there's no doubt that there's still a secular trend occurring of moving an offline process online. And the size of the market for customers that want an online, easy, kind of simple and fast lending decision and, and access to funds, I think that's only growing. I think what we've learned over the last several years, though, is the, the thing that's going to segment the market is price. And the, the, the population that's willing to pay you know, high APRs for that convenience is probably uh, smaller than the market that you know, expects more traditional kind of pricing that, that a bank would provide. So I think for a company like OnDeck, if that's the, the reality, you have to think through what are the right strategies to, to tap into still that addressable market. And that's why we've partnered with banks like Chase uh, to, to really uh, kind of go after those more price sensitive usually higher credit quality customers. And I, I do think the, uh, the market opportunity in that segment still remains very, very big. Right. Catherine, what would you say? Um, there are an estimated 26, 27 million <coughs> small businesses in the US. And there's not a really big reason that most of them wouldn't need capital like every other business. So from our perspective, um, we think that's the addressable market. Now, the fact of the matter is most of those 26, 27 million are actually very, very small businesses and, in fact, sole proprietorships. And it's really hard to um, deliver capital to those small businesses unless you have um, an automated technology-enabled solution that allows you to service them and provide capital and underwrite very cost-effectively. So from our perspective, we're still looking to serve that market in the US. Of course, it's a global market. We're partnered with global institutions. So the number is much bigger than that if you think about it, you know, if you think about the planet. But, but in the US, certainly, we think that's the size of our addressable market. And it's important to us to you know, deliver a great experience to all of them. I think that, um, you know, to wrap it up, uh, you know, banks would love to serve these businesses. That's why Chase has partnered with OnDeck. That's why we partner with banks. 80% of our customers bank with the top 10 banks in the U.S. They just can't get a loan from them. And I don't think that's likely to change anytime soon unless they partner with companies like ours. Yeah, from our perspective, when we think about the addressable market, we think about both the consumer side and the investor side. And over the 10 years that we've been in existence, uh, we've seen both of them grow up quite tremendously, both in scale and in scope. Um, today we have personal loans, auto refinance, a small business product, and a patient finance product. And when we started 10 years ago, it was a personal loans product. Uh, a few years ago, that market was $20 billion. Today it is upwards of 80 plus billion. We think of our addressable market for that single product as almost half of the trillion dollars of outstanding revolving debt. So in our heads, uh, even though we are past the first decade of Lending Club. We're only just getting started. Um, from the investor perspective, we started as a peer-to-peer -peer lender. Uh, in fact, we started as a Facebook app. Um, very few people knew that. In fact, I didn't know that when I joined Lending Club about a year ago. And uh, today, we have more than 150,000 retail investors, and almost 40% of our funding comes from banks. Um, new types of investors which are focused specifically on the credit space have emerged simply because of the scale that this marketplace has taken. And so we're very excited about the journey that's happened so far. And uh, as we look at the next decade, um, we fully expect this to grow equally rapidly, if not more so, because as far as we are concerned, the entire credit space is an addressable market for us. It's more a question of how quickly we can roll out products that address that. OK, so it doesn't sound like too many drastic changes in the size of the addressable market, but maybe differences in how to think about getting there. So Howard mentioned bank partnerships, which might not have been on Audex radar a decade ago, but are today. I think the Chase partnership has been announced, what, about two and a half years ago. 
And I think um, that was seen by many as kind of a validation of the type of way that these partnerships could go. Since then, we haven't seen a lot of you know, follow-on announcements like many uh, were predicting at the time. So Howard, how is the Chase partnership going? What um, you know, were you expecting on deck to, that to open the door to other deals? And um, why or why has that not happened sure. yet? So um, first off, I think we announced it about 18 months ago, mm -hmm. uh, two and a half. But uh, the partnership has been going great. Uh, had <clears throat> Chase been a, a true re a referral partner for on deck, uh, we, they would have been our biggest uh, originator last quarter. Uh, so from a volume perspective, from a credit perspective, from a customer satisfaction perspective, uh, I think uh, both, both parties are very impressed with where, we're, where we are and the roadmap uh, ahead. Uh, now to address your, your second question, why haven't other banks followed? I think, um, one, there's still a significant interest from banks around doing something. And I think banks have, uh, have kind of fallen in one of, of a couple of categories. One is they've decided that they're going to try it themselves. So Wells Fargo, if you remember, kind of announced this a similar product. I feel like it was over a year ago. I haven't seen much in the marketplace there. But you're certainly going to have banks that view this as their core competency and want to build out the solutions. Uh, the second is, is, is ones that maybe um, instead of looking for a holistic lending solution, they just want a, a, a front end that creates a, a, a seam, more seamless application process. Although the decisioning process and the underwriting model could be traditionally what the bank uses. Um, and it, you know, I think we've seen a couple of announcements with respect to uh, those types of relationships. I'm not sure that the products themselves are having much traction. And the third category is, is basically, you know, in innovation you have these like fast followers, but they're, I would call slow followers. They're I think really just wanting to see how the Chase program goes. And there's uh, you know, in, in the top 20 banks, there are a few in that category that kind of are just waiting and seeing and then, you know, waiting to assess their next move. Mm -hmm. Catherine, you guys have also partnered with some big global banks, as you've announced. Um, take us back uh, maybe 12 months, how those conversations have changed since then, since you maybe signed your first deal and whether uh, it gets any easier after that. Well, it's, it's amazing to us that actually they all came to us. So I, it's the global banks, and I, I think, are, are just moving more rapidly than U.S. banks. Perhaps they're not as hamstrung by a lot of the regulatory burden that U.S. banks um, have, but we've been really overwhelmed by the um, interest and the response. So they're moving really fast. It's, it's shocking how quickly we're going from a conversation to being live in a new market. So um, I, I feel like... They're, they're getting over this concern. Um, I guess you call it a compliance concern. We hear a lot about compliance, especially um, after last May. There's lots and lots of talk about compliance. And I think there's two kinds. There's, there's policy compliance and regulatory compliance. So we push really hard on policy compliance. Regulatory compliance is a given. But if you just need to check 10 boxes because you've been doing it for 20 years and somebody said you should do it, we push back on that and say, do you really have to do that? Because for us, the experience is really important. And that's the experience that these banks want to deliver to their customers. Again, in the US, things are moving a little more slowly. The conversations we still have, even last week, we had a conversation with a large bank. And they said, well, can you just do part of it manually? Can you just do this manually? And, and then you can automate that stuff. And we're like, no. You can't. You can if you want to, but why work with us? What's the point? So, Samir, we've seen some banks, uh, Goldman Sachs was here earlier, to kind of talking about their decision to enter the online consumer lending world. Uh, I'll give a plug for the Wall Street Journal right now, because we have a story online about Square, uh, the small business payments company and lender, getting into consumer lending today uh, with an announcement. You know, what do you make, Samir, of, of maybe tech companies that are, are not lenders first, but in adjacent businesses, PayPal, um, you know, others like Square that have decided to enter the lending business recently? I think it's a very exciting development. Um, it's also an endorsement of what is possible in this space. If you rewind and think about why this model was, or let's just call this model being online lending, was revolutionary 10 years ago, it was because most banks were just uncomfortable going into the open market outside of their own customer base, either from a credit perspective or a compliance perspective. It's been clearly demonstrated now that that is possible to do with confidence and, in fact, with better results than even with your own customers. And most fintech activity typically has tended to start with payments and then moved on to consumer lending and from there on small business, et cetera. So I see this as a natural transition as um, folks who don't start from financial services are getting more comfortable with looking at models like ours. Um, 
And essentially, each one of these players is starting with their own customer base where they have the comfort around open market or, shall we say, some confidence that fraud and credit is something they can assess better than a traditional lender. Um, I think this will just expand the addressable market for everyone. So we're very excited about that development. We're in conversation with some of these guys about how we might partner with them because what they do not have is financial services experience, but more importantly, once you choose to play in the sport of financial services, you really need to understand the rules of the game before you can win. And that's where regulation and really understanding how that works comes in. Um, so we're excited about the development and I, I expect we will see some interesting partnerships with some of these players um, and not necessarily more structurally with banks because banks themselves have gotten pretty good at the digital UX and they're making their foray into online lending starting from that position of a balance sheet and a pretty slick UX, I would say, at this point. Uh, Howard, I think it was Amazon that announced a couple weeks ago that they had lent more than $3 billion to merchants on the Amazon Marketplace platform. You know, I think Square has lent more than a billion and a half. PayPal working capital is also scaling. You know, you recently made the decision and on deck to kind of focus less on origination growth and more on profitability. But as as these kind of alternative alternative lenders ramp up their origination growth and, and on deck, you know, you know, hunkers down. You know, what what do you think about um, you know your ability to maybe reach customers that might be in the Square ecosystem or the Amazon ecosystem today? Yeah. So today we don't really bump up against. Uh, those three, those three providers, largely because they're focused on online. Uh, in the case of PayPal and uh, and, and Amazon, and for uh, for Square, really the much smaller merchants. Um, but listen, I think they have some good things to you know you would want to appreciate in the model, and that they have this proprietary data source uh, in terms of how they collect the loans back. It's often through the processing, the settlements. Um, but you know what they're doing, as far as I understand it, is really more data extrapolation based on historicals, more so than true commercial underwriting on a business. So for instance, they might not look at the other kind of personal or business debts that the owner is, uh, the business is taking out. Uh, they may not understand utilization, they might understand kind of historical trends or other, other revenue um, uh, uh, forms outside of kind of how they're collecting. Uh, and what we saw in 2008 when we were competing against merchant cash advance and you know, as a reminder, the way merchant cash advance companies collect is basically through the Visa and MasterCard terminals. Uh, the, the model works well in good times, but in, 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 in a downturn, uh, what you see is customers kind of gaming the system, uh, setting up other terminals, asking customers to pay in cash. So that, that would be my concern from a model perspective. Uh, and just from a market perspective and competitive perspective, we're still really not bumping up against them. Hmm. Catherine, anything you'd like to add? We see them a fair amount, um, I think, because partially we serve smaller businesses, partially because we got our start serving e-commerce businesses. I think um, they, they offer great products that their customers really like. Square customers are really happy with the product, so are PayPal customers. Amazon's actually serving really big customers, too, so they're deploying that capital in large chunks and in smaller chunks. But they all are uh, fishing from a small pond, so to speak, so they can understand business performance, as you mentioned, in, in that particular ecosystem, but we all are able to serve customers you know, across you know, larger segments. So I think we'll continue to see them. I think they're doing a wonderful job, and I think they're continuing to push the user experience, which is important to us, and it makes all of us better. Mm -hmm. Now, one benefit those companies have highlighted is this kind of captive base of merchants that they don't have to spend a lot of money or really a lot of effort marketing to. Um, Samir, I think Lending Club has a pretty diverse mix of marketing from direct mail to you know, online aggregators. Uh, how has um, kind of the market or the, the, those channels, you know, have they grown in prominence? Have they grown in expense over time? You know, take us back to a year ago and, and where we are today. I, I typically don't like going back a year ago. It was a pretty <laughs> tough time. Uh, and May 9th also coincided, coincided with my first day at the company, so it was, <laughs> it's been a character-building experience uh, at the very least. But um, you know, I think the distribution channels have also evolved, um, particularly because the awareness around the consumer base and our customer base has risen pretty rapidly around this, uh, typical, uh, this particular product category. Uh, I would say the partner channel, which is the credit karmas or the lending trees of the world, have certainly risen uh, in terms of share. 
<coughs> direct mail continues to be very important. Um, and we try and be very responsive to our customers' needs. So we also have a phone sales channel at this point because there's certain we found that there are certain consumers who are just uncomfortable applying purely online, uh, or halfway through the application, they want to actually speak to a person. We also found that just having a phone number on the direct mail piece gives us a lift, even though the people don't actually call in, which is, you could, you could debate whether that's the right reaction the consumer is having or not, but what you can't debate is that is the reaction they're having, and you want to address that to be able to help as many people as possible. Um, <clears throat> so. Yeah, arguably a more captive, assuming it is really a captive customer base, gives people an advantage. But I still keep coming back to, you know, you look at outstanding credit, more than $3 trillion in the United States um, as arguably one of the largest players in the country in personal loans. We have 30 bips of that share. It's just a massive market out there. So we're not really worried about direct competition just yet. Um, obviously, it causes price pressure. but that's for the benefit of the customers. And our investor demand has never been higher. Um, we, we saw a complete standstill from institutional investors and bank investors after May 9th last year. Uh, today, we are oversubscribed from a funding perspective. So we feel terrific about that. And uh, the economics work really well for us. Now, Howard, as, as I mentioned earlier, you recently made the decision to focus less on growing originations more on maintaining profitability as a company. Um, you know, you hadn't made that decision previously. It had been kind of the other way around. Yeah. So why don't you walk us through what happened over the course of the past you know, six or nine months that, that led you to make that strategic change? Yeah, and, and listen, you never want to be have your, your eggs in, in one basket, all growth or all, all profitability. It's always a balance. And, and to be honest, the, the, the key driver of, of the decision, the pivot, uh, for those that, that may not be aware, we, uh, we announced last quarter that uh, we'd be uh, engaging in a strategic pivot to focus more on driving profitability for the, the, for the business. Um, but the key driver there was this, this belief in the market opportunity, that it, it remained very big, that uh, on deck and the assets that we've created were uniquely positioned to, to win in the opportunity. But you need capital to do so. And in the past, we were able to raise you know, capital from VCs at very high valuations. And our, our view was that going forward, the way to best take advantage of that market opportunity was to become a profitable company and use the retained earnings to invest. So <laughs> internally now, we're kind of using examples like Google uh, that has like the cash cow from the search engine business. And they're able to innovate and really invest. So that was a big driver of, 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 of the decision and really the, the focus on how do we create long-term value for shareholders, and the best way to do it was to be a profitable entity. Mm -hmm. Catherine, uh, you're the only private company, you're representing the only private company here on the panel. Um, does that give you an advantage in, in maybe putting off profitability longer? You don't have to answer to public shareholders, or, or how are you thinking about that uh, determination today? Well, my co-founder Rob's in the audience. He knows what I think about being a public company. I think it does put, it puts a big burden, and it prevents you from potentially focusing on the R&D efforts, perhaps, in which you want to engage, because there is such a drive from the market to get to profitability. Um, you know, we, we are fortunate, A, that we have investors who really support our large vision that requires investment in technology. And so we're able to continue to do that with always an eye towards profitability. That is something that, you know, we talk about at every board meeting, at every, you know, management meeting that we have internally. That's it's always important to us because you can't make up a loss on volume. So, so you definitely need to start making money. Yeah. Well, seeing the, the changes in the on deck or Lenny Club stock over the past year, how, how has that influenced uh, your decision on when or whether to uh, pursue an IPO? It hasn't been the best comp. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I don't think it certainly encourages us that we want to enter the public market anytime soon. Um, just not, not necessarily because of performance, I, I, I joke, but just, just because of, again, the scrutiny and the requirements, the obligations that it places on you, I think, um, just from a shareholder perspective and from a public market perspective. Yeah, I would say we find ourselves in a very different position because of the way our original model worked, which was the peer-to-peer -peer lending framework was enabled by SEC registered notes. There was a lot of information that was out there already, and our investors had a lot of visibility into how the company was performing. And frankly, having gone public was a huge, huge advantage for us, particularly at a time of stress like last year. 
we had $800 million of cash in our balance sheet. And I would venture in the absence of that, we may not have been an independent company today um, because <clears throat> funding completely stopped. But that balance sheet is a backstop for us, which we ended up not really using for funding, but just knowing that it was there was a huge confidence boost for us internally, but also for our uh, platform investors. So yes, it comes with more scrutiny, and there are more stakeholders that you're ne needing to manage. But if you're able to hit that escape velocity and go public at a positive or a very positive contribution margin like we are at, I think it's, uh, it can be a huge strategic advantage. I want to focus and, and talk a little bit about credit. Now, to overgeneralize, uh, I think the sector kind of experienced an origination boom in 2015. Some standards had changed at some lenders. You saw volume expand. Uh, you saw some upticks in delinquencies and defaults in, in some pockets of consumer and small business. And since then, uh, a lot of folks have kind of retooled the credit model and, and hunkered down. What, um, what, what, why don't we go over the, like, the state of you know, the credit you're originating today, how that might compare to, to 2016, and, and what kind of lessons do you take from that experience? Howard, do you want to go first? Sure. And I'm prohibited in what I could discuss as a public company in terms of intra quarter <laughs> kind of trends. But uh, yeah, our, our priority number one, and it really it's, it's priority number one all the time, not just recently, is, is credit management. And we needed to arrest some of the credit trends that we saw in 2016. Uh, primarily from the extension of term to our customers. Um, so, you know, we made a series of moves in, in Q1. Uh, we feel good about what we've done. And I think what's changed now is, is in terms of the level, the, the investments we're making in our risk and analytics team, uh, we're kind of doubling down on, the, on investments in that area. So our goal is to basically reduce our risk profile without having a material impact or any impact on approval rate. So a good example there is like consumer reporting, which we, we historically we have a personal guarantee, but we've never reported to consumer bureaus. Um, uh, another example is just taking in more data sources to, to feed our models. So there's, there's just a lot of activity going on in that front, a lot of investment um, that I think it certainly encourages me as a, as a CFO in terms of where we could take both growth and, and, and loss rates in the future. Mm -hmm. So it was mostly the extension in term, maybe in 2016, that explained some of the upticks in, in Yeah, and, and I think correspondingly, uh, the, uh, the increase in average loan size. Mm. Um, you know, we, we had basically thought that uh, the reduction in payment stress, because as you extend term, you reduce payment stress, we thought that would outweigh the risk that, of duration risk. And uh, what we saw was that duration risk kind of outweighed uh, the benefit you got from the reduction in uh, payment stress. Catherine, what about you? Uh, I say all the time that I'd rather be lucky than smart. And we are very fortunate that we did a lot of our experimenting in 2013 when we had a smaller portfolio. So um, going into 2014, 2015, 2016, we were really able to grow. Um, what we've seen over the last, gosh, eight quarters is improvements in credit quality across the board. What well, we've been able to continue to acquire customers and, um, and expand you know, the lines and deliver more capital. So I'm super grateful that, that we learned some lessons um, early on in our history. So I, I, I suspect we'll continue to see that. At some point, you say to yourself, I think it's too good. Maybe we need to take some more risk. So I suspect the pendulum will continue to swing in both directions. Mm. Yeah, we, um, <clears throat> we're constantly testing where we feel most comfortable with credit. And I think the toughest period for us was last year in Q4, when we were very, very eager to demonstrate the return to growth for LC. Um, and that's when we tightened some of our credit standards. We've had 10 years of credit data and almost 2 million borrowers at this point, um, and multiples of that in terms of applicants. And um, our credit team is very focused on making sure that we are delivering the expected returns to investors. And so when we made the credit cuts in, in Q4 last year, those were mostly in the highest risk grades, and we're really happy that we made that tough call because that's flowed through, through very favorably for us at this point. Um, I would also say that there's a lot of focus on rising interest rates and how to think about credit from a credit risk perspective. I think there's a very important dimension of product innovation over here. Um, the way we are expanding our credit box is, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Joint app is one of those where a household is applying for a loan together as opposed to every individual for themselves. And that allows you to say yes to more people and in some cases give them better rates 
for the same amount because they're applying jointly. The second one we're working on is something called direct pay. Um, a lot of our loans are for debt consolidation, but what we found, and we had a very honest conversation about this internally, not everyone actually uses the loan for the purpose they actually say they're gonna take the loan for. Uh, shocking, right? Uh, but, you know, us saying if you're applying for a debt consolidation loan, tell us what loan you're looking to pay down, and we will actually pay that lender directly, allows us to lend more confidently around some of these things. So um, that's the second point I would make, which is not to be underestimated, and we're very excited about the possibilities there. The third one, which we were very curious about, and I think the industry is still learning about this, is where the online lending product falls in the payment hierarchy when a household or a consumer or a small business actually faces financial stress. And we were very pleasantly surprised recently when we looked at some of our internal data and there was some data published externally that uh, the personal loan, even though there was no other relationship with us as LC as an example, was not at the bottom of the payment hierarchy. In fact, it was um, uh, pretty high up in the payment hierarchy and that's showing through in some of the uh, credit performance, which is quite counterintuitive, but I will piggyback on Catherine's phrase, I'd rather be lucky than good or smart. And in this case, we're still, I think, finding out how consumers are looking or will behave around this particular product because we're still in the early innings here. Now, Samir, I, I forget if you're still doing this, but Lending Club uh, used to put out like an 8K or, or a blog post every time it changed its credit, po credit policy. And I guess the, the advantage that you'd cite for that is transparency, right? You want to, you know, the investors to feel comfortable in the platform. Um, but if you're changing, you know, credit policy too much and announcing it every time, it can come, give the impression that, you know, it's, it's more fluid than maybe investors would like. How do you think about that trade-off in kind of being as public-facing as you'd like to be in that versus... Um, I know you say it could come across that way. Um, actually, it has come across that way, and we've had to fight that battle. Mm -hmm. uh, we do believe that um, as a two-sided marketplace, we owe our investors that transparency, and we do... Um, release that information when we make any substantive changes. Um, the reality is incumbent financial institutions make changes to pricing all the time. They're just not as transparent about it. Hmm. And the way we think of our role in the industry, particularly given our model, is to always have a pulse in both the consumer or the borrower and the investor side. And try and balance that supply and demand, and we have a bunch of levers for that, while being very responsible around credit. And uh, this is where a little bit of a stress of being a public company comes in. I would love to be able to choose the investors, but in many cases, investors choose us. But we have seen that folks who are not comfortable with the flexibility as we see it, or fluidity as they see it, um, they choose to exit the stock. Um, but we are very committed to continuing to be transparent in, in how we operate. Um, but I will just underscore the point that it is more a difference in perception than reality. I would say credit card companies change pricing all the time and probably more frequently than we do. Um, we are just more transparent about it. Hmm. And the reasons for us why we do them are very, a very different set of incentives than what I would argue a traditional company does. Hmm. Um, switching a, a little bit from credit to uh, investor demand for credits, I mean, Howard, you know, on deck had historically sold loans to third party investors, had done its own securitizations, and had maintained a lot of loans uh, made on its books. Now you've kind of de emphasized the, the whole loan sales to third parties. You're keeping a lot more on your balance sheets, still securitizing some. Um, you know, how. How, how rapid do you think about changing kind of that mix of funding? You know, what, what kind of conversations do you have with investors to say, well, we, we have a relationship of years, long relationship of buying loans from you, but you know what, we're just going to kind of limit that channel now and, and hold a lot more of our loans on our balance sheet going forward? Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, we, we've de-emphasized the whole loan sale business at OnDeck. I think in 2000. 14, 2015, that market was, uh, to be honest, was a little irrational. Mm -hmm. And we were opportunistic, we took advantage of it. We probably became a little too reliant on it and that affected our financial performance in 2016. Uh, now that it's become uh, at least rational, maybe irrational on the other side where gain on sell levels are, are depressed, uh, what we've 
really focused on is just having you know that access to capital, having it be uh, diversified. And at the end of the day, what's really important is the cost of that capital. So you can equate, even in a marketplace model, what's the effective cost of capital by selling it. And uh, I think you know the team's done a, a great job this year diversifying uh, the uh, um, uh, the funding base. We brought on Credit Suisse, brought on Aries. Uh, so now we have relationships with U.S. banks, international banks, hedge funds, and you know we've extended maturities and all at the same time brought down our, our funding cost. So uh, I'm happy with where we're at, and uh, it's 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 an, an ongoing process though. Uh, we're constantly kind of just giving company updates to our investors and. You know, building out like a, almost an IR function for for lenders as well as in addition to equity mm -hmm. investors. Uh, Catherine, I want to ask you a, a similar question, but first I want to uh, ask the audience to start thinking of questions that they want to ask. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a microphone or if those are through the app, but um, let's get those ready. So, Catherine, has how has Cabbage changed its uh, financing strategy on on the loan side over the past kind of 12 months, if if at all? And what kind of observations have you seen on just investor demand for small business loans in general? I wouldn't say much has changed, certainly in the last year. We've always been a balance sheet lender. Um, you know, we started securitizing in 2014. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, so so, I, so that strategy has remained the same. Um, we're really fortunate that our growth has coincided with incredibly stable credit quality. So we've seen a lot of demand. Our last um, facility was oversubscribed significantly. So um, that's been a good experience for us, but we're always looking for um, ways to fund different types of products that we want to offer that may not necessarily fit into those vehicles that we have today, whether it's international expansion or whether it's different um, markets or different products that we want to offer. So um, I would say there's constant exploration and interest in our, on our side in finding new investors who are interested in investing in new product types. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, well, those keep coming in. Maybe I'll, um, we've talked a lot about kind of the past 12 months and, and lessons learned. Uh, Samir, why don't you take us into the future and kind of, if we're on this panel a year from today, what do you think Lending Club looks like as a company um, a year from now? Um, bigger, better. Uh, <laughs> um, a, a year from now, I mean, that's a pretty short, uh, Time frame, but I, I do think where we are headed, uh, we're looking at a pretty rapid expansion in both scale and scope. And by scope, I mean different kind of borrower products um, as we look to enter new credit categories. But uh, I also expect that um, we will see a lot more activity and innovation on the investor side of the house. Um, we just recently did a securitization, uh, which we sponsored ourselves, even though we didn't contribute to it. Um, and we're looking at a few other structures to expand the box for other investors, whether it's foreign investors, et cetera, to come in. So I do think that theme of growth and how the investor side feels it will be an important piece of the discussion. Um, and um, with rising interest rates, I'm sure the credit question will continue to be something that will be prominent. Catherine, what about Cabbage a year from today? What do you see it looking like? More more stuff, more, more markets, more products, more customers, more um, ways to finance them. I think um, you'll just see you know, continued expansion from us. Howard? Sure. I think we're profitable, very mm -hmm. profitable. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, actually, internally, a lot of the discussions are more about growth uh, now than just achieving profitability. Uh, so I think it's enhancements to our current product set, enhancements to distribution strategy, enhancements to uh, our, our credit model so that we can improve more customers, and then really think about what's, what's the next product. So uh, we've talked about in the past you know, equipment leasing, credit cards, uh, factoring. These are all very interesting products that still, for the most part, have um, outdated kind of methods for, uh, for, for getting the funding. So um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if a year from now we have a third product on the shelf. Hmm. Um, we, we talked a little bit about the competitive environment in terms of tech companies entering in the space. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of online lenders at much smaller scales than Lending Club, Cabbage, and On Deck, who received VC funding maybe two or three years ago and are up for their latest kind of fundraising, maybe now, maybe in the next six months. What do you think happens to the number of companies in the space, both consumer and small business? Uh, Samir, we can start with you. Um, I think we're already starting to see a narrowing of the field. Um, particularly as VC funding has moved, largely moved on, I would say, from online lending to insure tech or 
other areas. Uh, we are seeing flat to down rounds um, at Lending Club. I'm also responsible for M&A, and the, just the sheer flow of inbounds has increased quite rapidly over the last six months, where companies are looking for a home either because they have not hit escape velocity on the acquisition side or on the funding side. Um, so my expectation is that we will see a narrowing of the field, which we've already started observing, which we think will be a good thing, and we're well positioned to take advantage of that, um, because there was some irrational pricing that had showed up in the market um, as different folks try to get to scale and grow their way out of trouble, uh, is how I would characterize it. So we're happy that some of this is happening. I'm not sure whether it'll be consolidation versus just a clearing out. That remains to be seen. So what kind of features would you look for in a, in a potential acquisition target since you're kind of well-placed there? So uh, we're looking at uh, a couple of categories. Um, any new credit product or a credit category that allows us uh, an inorganic entry where the existing company can benefit from the scale on our investor side would be very attractive to us. So a very strong product with a decent brand name. That's one. The second, we're very mindful of the fact that today, as a credit facilitator, um, our relationship with the borrower, while very positive at the point of application, isn't very um, consistent throughout the uh, length of the loan. So we're talking to a few companies who are who operate in the space of borrower engagement on an ongoing basis. Um, and that's a very interesting area for us. And I'm pretty excited about some of the uh, innovation that's going on over there, which is beyond the old school PFM model, but um, looking at modulating people's payment behavior, et cetera, for their own benefit. Catherine Howard, do you guys think any differently about potential acquisitions today or kind of narrowing of the field in small business lending? I think that the um, the graveyard of small business lenders is becoming full. Um, we are always receiving inbound, you know, requests for um, I guess review of transactions. We're not looking to acquire other lenders. That's not really interesting to us. We feel like we can acquire those customers directly. That doesn't. It's not the kind of company that we are. Um, rumors of our acquisition of On Deck were untrue also. Um, so, so that's not happening, I can say right here. But, um, but anyway, we, um, I think we're thinking about companies that augment what we do, which is focus on data and technology. We are really interested in anything related to um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, other things that potentially benefit the small business ecosystem, things that help them run their business. So from our perspective, that's, that's our focus when we think about possible M&A activities. Okay, Howard, you get the last word. Yeah, I agree largely with uh, Catherine's uh, uh, thoughts there. Yeah, I think we're more interested in in companies if, if we were to acquire that somehow enhance our strategic value proposition, either maybe through a new product, new capability, uh, new distribution source, et cetera. So uh, we do get a lot of inbound inquiries, but we haven't pulled the trigger on anything yet. Uh, okay, well, we are out of time. Uh, I want to thank these three for joining me today and uh, enjoy the rest of your conference, guys.